first and foremost, let's talk about what happened to the crew on the Challenger. All seven crew members were killed in the disaster, but it's not clear exactly how or when. From the video of the explosion, it seems like all seven astronauts were gone as soon as the explosion happened, like it happened instantly. But as time went on, investigations revealed that the people on board may have lived longer than we thought. There were these oxygen packs that could be turned on in case of an emergency. And it turned out three of the seven had been switched on and only someone inside the shuttle could turn them on. So that means some of the crew had to have been awake and conscious enough to do that even after the explosion. The cabin where the crew was strapped in crashed into the ocean at a speed of 200 miles per hour. So NASA believes that some crew members may have survived the explosion, but they were killed by the impact of the crash. In the aftermath of the chaos, an investigation was launched to look into what caused the disaster. And friends, what they found did not make NASA look good. Leading up to the launch, the space shuttle program had a whole bunch of red flags. The program as a whole was considered safe, but there had been some technical issues. These didn't result in disaster, but they did foreshadow what could, and eventually did, happen to the Challenger. Without getting into literal rocket science, let's just quickly get like on the same page and learn what an O-ring is, since they're about to come up a lot. I know, when I first heard O-ring, I was picturing something like a Nuva ring. You know, that thing that you pop in the fridge before you pop it into the vag? Not the same thing. Okay, anyway, back to spaceships. Now, the only purpose of these things is to seal gaps when two things like pipes or joints are put together. And the O-ring stops any fluid or gas or whatever is traveling through the pipes from escaping and leaking. You know, in fancy glass Tupperware, there's that rubber ring around the cover. It's pretty much that, okay? It's that. It creates a seal, so whatever's in it is airtight. You get it. I'm glad you do. Well, pretty quickly, investigators found out that the Challenger had a technical failure. And worse than that, NASA knew the O-rings had problems years before the launch. Let's introduce our other bad guys, a contractor for the space shuttles, a company called Morton Thiokol. Now, they're the manufacturer that won the government contract to actually make the rocket boosters for the space shuttles. And as early as 1977, a test revealed that the O-rings were not performing the way they were supposed to. Essentially, the problem was this. The O-rings were not able to maintain a perfect seal. And that was like literally their only job. But when Morton Thiokol reported these results to NASA, they also reported that these results would not cause any significant problems. And let's be clear, we're talking about like teeny tiny measurements here like they underperformed by up to 52 one thousandths of an inch, which I think to you and I is like the same thing as no inches. And I guess like that's how NASA felt too. So, I mean, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. They get a pass on the first one. I mean, they reported the problem, but didn't think it was big enough to change anything. I mean, that's okay. Plenty more tests where that came from. You don't just strap a bunch of people, including the nation's most beloved teacher, to a rocket without making sure it's safe first. I mean, you would think, you would hope. In fact, people at Marshall Space Center, which was the space shuttle headquarters for NASA, got all of the information and were able to draw their own conclusions. And they sent a memo saying that the O-rings were a quote, design deficiency and recommended it be corrected before going any further. Now this was 1977. Challenger took its final flight in 1986, almost a decade after the first people pointed out the problems with the O-rings. Ooh, some money's in the wall. Then things get worse. Instead of just ignoring the problem, it straight up stops being reported. The O-rings continue to fail tests, this time after actual flights. In 1981, an inspection was done on a shuttle and the O-rings had been damaged by the heat they were exposed to during flight. Then in 1985, a year before the Challenger disaster, O-rings were damaged even further by exposure to extreme heat. This was once again written off as quote unquote acceptable. So people just kept using them like nothing was wrong. 
these little O-rings continue to have issues for the next four shuttle flights. Now, O-rings were having problems not just at high temperatures, but low ones as well. At 50 degrees Fahrenheit, which is a comfortable afternoon temperature, a failure occurred. And guess what happened? More memos. So different engineers and managers at both NASA and Morton Thiokol again went back and forth about the O-ring problem. NASA at one point threatened to take away Morton Thiokol's billion dollar government contract and give it to a competitor unless they fix the O-ring problem. And there we go, like hit him where it hurts, right? That'll make him change, sort of. Robert Lund, the vice president of engineering at Morton Thiokol, created an O-ring task force to get to the bottom of the issue, I guess. And at least one engineer came up with a proposal to fix the problem. Now, the problem with that was, it was gonna take several years to put his plan into place, meaning both Morton and NASA would have to shut everything down. I mean, for years, and neither of them wanted to do that. NASA wanted to put a regular person in space before kids got distracted by MTV and like stopped caring about science. I mean, just an observation here, but you know what would really stop kids from caring about science? Maybe watching seven astronauts lose their lives on live television, but okay. We know NASA knew there was issues with the O-rings, but they sure as hell weren't gonna like cancel shuttle launches over it. In October of 1985, another shuttle flight took off. And maybe you guessed it, more O-ring problems. One member of the O-ring task force recommended they stop shipping space shuttle parts with these O-rings because of how much of a risk they were. But no one never did anything. Okay, jump ahead. It's the night before the Challenger launches. Remember I mentioned how cold it was overnight? I mean, there was ice on the platform. The launch had been delayed, it was a whole thing. Well, I guess the O-rings got all messed up from the temperature changes. Basically, the colder it got, the less they worked. And the temperature outside on the day of the launch was way colder than any time they tested them before. Because of this, engineers at Morton Thiokol strongly recommended not launching the Challenger on January 28th, but their bosses were feeling, I don't know, major pressure from NASA to give the launch the green light. So the engineers, who knew the shuttle the best, were totally ignored. Alan McDonald, the lead engineer, said directly to NASA before the launch, quote, if anything happens to this launch, I wouldn't want to be the person that has to stand in front of the board of inquiry to explain why we launched, end quote. Turns out NASA gave Morton Thiokol a $75 million bonus despite all these O-ring problems. And at the time of the accident, there had been over 25 instances of these O-rings failing. A manager at Morton Thiokol wrote up a recommendation to continue with the launch, even though all of the engineers involved, including that lead I just quoted, clearly refused to sign it. Mm -mm, mm -mm. On the NASA side, even some management took the engineer's warning to heart and recommended against launching. But the highest authorities ignored them and approved liftoff anyway. So on both sides, there were people saying this launch had to be called off. They were pointing out the specific problem that would eventually cause Challenger to explode just a few hours later, and they were ignored. I mean, think of it like this. Everyone thought the Titanic was quote unquote unsinkable, you know? Tons of tests done on the shuttle pointed out a huge safety issue, and they had nearly a decade to fix it, and they didn't. And some of the engineers who raised their concerns were bullied into silence. In the end, the cause of the disaster was those damn O-rings. I mean, they were supposed to seal a joint in one of the shuttle's rocket boosters, but the record low temperatures during the morning of the launch stiffened the rubber O-rings, which meant that they couldn't seal the rocket the right way. Because of this, hot gas from the rocket booster on the right side leaked out and burned its way into the tank that held the liquid fuel. It was this tank that exploded. I'm using quotes around exploded because it didn't actually explode in the standard definition of the word. There was no detonation shock wave or like loud bang sound. What looked like smoke from an explosion was a cloud of liquid oxygen and hydrogen gas spilling into the atmosphere. 
and then that turned into a fireball. And this is why it's called the Challenger disaster and not the Challenger explosion. Now all this caused a chain reaction. And when the shuttle disconnected from the fuel tank, it changed the direction it was flying. Because it was traveling so fast, the shuttle was ripped apart. Sadly, seven people died because every single warning was ignored by the people who had power to make sure this would not happen. This all happened at the time when the space program desperately needed good attention from the public. If they got that, then they could get more funding to keep pushing into space. NASA knew they were bettering humanity with like more advanced satellites and things like the space station, but they needed money to keep it up. I mean, it, it wasn't all good intentions. NASA wanted to remain the biggest dick in the world of space travel. And we Americans historically do not love it when we lose the number one spot in anything. And it wasn't just the Soviet space program we were up against anymore. The European Space Agency was starting to look like real competition. The space race may have slowed down, but it definitely didn't go away completely. And NASA refused to lose that race. Now don't get me wrong, Morton Thiokol seems like they, they may have blood on their hands too. They did not want to lose a big government contract by standing up to the very people who gave it to them. I mean, NASA was lining Morton's pockets with money. Management at Morton didn't want that to go away. If Morton really took a stand, like put their foot down, they risked being replaced by a company who would do whatever NASA wanted. The launch of Challenger had already been delayed multiple times. And if the teacher in space project was going to make the splash it needed to, NASA had to take advantage of all the attention they were getting from people. So that explains why everyone in power wanted the launch to happen as quickly as possible. But why did it need to be that day specifically? I mean, if weather was the main concern, couldn't they just like push it another day or two until the conditions were perfect for a safe launch? You know, who do we blame for that? Friends, put your hands together for a favorite villain in the dark history universe, President Ronald Reagan. 